So Connor, thank you so much for joining. Connor, you're the CEO of Kimco. Um, where are you? Where are you? I guess zooming in from today. Today I'm actually in Rhode Island, so uh, not not in the office. It may look like it with my virtual background, but um, we're still full remote. And uh, you know, it's it's actually been really interesting to see how everybody changes um, with going to a full remote um, workforce and. I mean, in a lot of ways, communication has improved, which we would think is counterintuitive, but um, it's pretty incredible when you, when you, you know, encourage people and enable them to get together, you know, very, very easily on a regular basis. Um, and in a lot of ways, it sort of has broken down the walls in between the different departments and made everybody actually um, feel like one big team. Yeah, it's amazing how much I've heard that comment from, from, companies in tech and also companies in real estate that it's so shocking. It's so surprising to CEOs that like this backup protocol of, oh, we, we could in theory operate remotely is actually like everyone's positively surprised by how productive they are. Is there anything that's you found is actually more productive than, than having an office in a virtual environment? I mean, you don't have the commute time, right? So if you think about like all the lost time and everybody is, that's the one finite amount that you have, right? So if you think about like my commute into the office is about an hour and you know, there's, there's that time of getting like ramped to work um, and you don't have that ramp, right? You just sort of all of a sudden, there is that trade off though, that there is no off switch, right? I mean, I, I feel like uh, the two of us have talked over the weekends and it doesn't matter what time it is. Uh, and I like your virtual background better than my virtual background. <laughs> um, but it's, it's true. I think there's, I, somebody made the comment too, and I think it resonated with me, is that there, you're, we're at a point where there's still a lot of lockdowns, right? So a lot of the things that you would be doing to um, get some fresh air or just get you know, disconnected for a little bit, those options are not necessarily yet available. So I think we're still in this sort of tweener, call it a honeymoon period of, working remotely where you don't really have any other option other than to work your tail off. And we're obviously in the, in the middle of a pandemic and in retail. Um, so we're, we're obviously working 24 seven to try and make sure the, the vast majority of our retailers make it to the other side of this. And I'm curious from, from just looking now at like retail, I mean, this has been a huge shock, right? Like a lot of stores are just closed. Um, but in your case, being grocery anchored, I imagine you have a mix of, essential businesses and, and non-essential essential businesses. How did you just take inventory? Like at the beginning of the crisis, what was like Kimco's protocol to be like, what's the damage? What do I need to do? Yeah, look, there's, there was a lot of things that when this occurred, we sort of went into um, crisis mode. Um, first and foremost, we focused on liquidity, making sure that, hey, give ourselves the advantage to have access to capital. Um, we did a, we had 15 banks participate in a, uh, a term loan. So like a short term bond is a way to think about it, uh, where it was a one year, um, loan with a one year extension. We've already actually paid that back, um, because we've actually been able to access long-term bonds at all time, low coupons. We just did a $500 million, 10 year green bond, uh, at 2.7%, uh, which is, you know, tying our all time lowest coupon. Um, so liquidity was first and foremost to make sure you have access to capital and just the ability to navigate. Um, second and, and foremost was just making sure that, you know, we, we understand the census of what we're dealing with. So we developed actually a, uh, a tech tool um, that we're just calling the tenant tracker that pretty much gives us real time data on every tenant in our entire portfolio. So over 6,000 um, leases and to give us an idea of when they close, when they open, if they're partially open, you know, the restrictions in each state, the restrictions in each municipality. Because what was wild in the, in the beginning of this is, you know, what you deem essential is not necessarily what I deem essential or what, more importantly, what the municipality where our asset is located deems essential. So, And, and was, that, was that purely a jurisdictional thing? Meaning different yep. counties had completely different definitions? Completely different. Completely wow. different. And so that's why we had to get so localized because... You can't just say, 
you know, a Michael's, which is an arts and crafts retailer, um, is deemed essential um, because 80% of their stores were deemed essential, 20% of them were deemed non-essential. Um, you know, the easy ones are the major food groups, right? That the grocery stores, the pharmacies, the home improvements, which make up some of the biggest um, tenants in our portfolio. But then when you get down to the nuance, like there were some municipalities that GameStop was deemed essential because think of like, there, there's nothing else to do. So it's like the gamers, right. <laughs> they're, they're, you know, they're, they're essential services. Right. Um, and so it was, it was amazing to see like how you had to get so localized and luckily, you know, our portfolio, we transformed it to be um, very concentrated and we have boots on the ground in all these areas so that we had real time data to understand who was going to need the most help and then who could we assist relatively quickly. And then we launched our tenant assistance program, our TAP program, which really allowed us to make sure that we were putting resources behind helping the small shop tenants navigate the current situation. We felt like the large players in our business, the Walmarts, the Targets, the Costcos, the Home Depots, they can navigate this. Um, but we need to help those uh, that, that don't have the balance sheets, that don't have the cash on hand. So the hair and nail salons, the restaurants, the, the, the dry cleaners, the most impacted categories right. that we felt when we were talking about, should we give them capital to help them or should we give them resources? And so because the PPP program was up and running, we decided to give them resources to navigate that. And so we gave them all free legal advice. So we had outside attorneys because they're probably not going to trust the, the attorney from the landlord. So we decided to, to, to hire outside attorneys to help all these retailers navigate the process so they could get access to capital. And over uh, 400 um, tenants signed up for it. They were able to access over $20 million of PPP financing and they were still going. You know, there, obviously there's still more capital available there and we're encouraging them to, um, to continue to participate. And then it's just sort of a process from there, making sure that the, the centers are, you know, you ramp up your, 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 your cleanliness, you make sure that it is literally shiny whenever they walk, when everybody walks in, because there's a perception of, hey, if, if the center is really looking great, then there's, a, there's less of a risk, even though that's not necessarily the case, because obviously nobody knows who has it or who doesn't. Um, and so we just wanted to take extra precaution to make sure that our curb appeal and the, the, the cleanliness of our centers was, was top notch because we felt like that would invite people back to the center, um, in a more easier fashion. And then we launched curbside pickup, which again has become an extension of how people shop where depending on your risk averse, um, you can come in and contact less shop, any, now any retailer in our portfolio. We were watching that happen. But it's done through Kimco. Is that like a Kimco app that where you interface with the retailers and the customers? Yeah. So we did this. So in the in the midst of the, of the of the worst of it, we saw that the essential folks were doing curbside pickup on their own platform, and we thought, you know what, we should do that for the non-essential folks, so that when we're allowed to reopen, they can take advantage of it as well. Right. And so we launched it at Kimco. We actually trademarked curbside pickup. Um, and so we launched it nationwide and we took the approach that our customer is not going to necessarily download the Kimco app. They're going to download the target app, the Home Depot app, you know, th that's where they're going to, to download the app. So what we did was we did the low tech approach of just saying, look, what do people look for when they come into a shopping center? We sort of, um, thought about, you know, how you park at a stadium, you know, with the light poles and it's like lot A and then you're, you're in spot A4. So what we did was we put exactly that. We put you know the letters up on the light poles right in front of where different nodes of retail is. We striped the, the, um, the, the spaces in like neon green so that it's easy to find. And then we just put numbers on the spots. And so, and then you, all you do is you come in and where, whatever app you ordered from, whether it's you know Postmates, Uber Eats, DoorDash, whatever it is, or the retailer's app, they just, you just ping them back and forth to say, hey, the retailer will tell you to, hey, say park in lot B and tell me which spot you park in when you get there. And so if you park in B4, then all of a sudden they, they take the goods out to you. What's interesting about all the things you mentioned is like the, the what's kind of striking about it is like, it seems that the response of like a large multi-asset super institutional landlord would just inherently be better than an individual landlord. Meaning, did you feel like Kimco as such a large institutional player 
had an advantage in just having the money to develop, you know, apps like you mentioned, but also that kind of give and take with different tenants and being able to balance across the portfolio. Do you, th do you think it really favored the larger players in retail? No question. No question about it. I mean, there's, in a lot of ways, we tried to lead by example. And so what we did was we made sure that others could utilize our resources. So for example, like our website, our COVID response was, you know, what the restrictions were on each and every municipality, you know, what are the emergency services that are available in each municipality, what programs are available in each municipality. And so, you know, ICSC, which is, you know, 60,000 plus members, um, was utilizing our website as like their, you know, source of information. And so we could be um, in a lot of ways sharing best practices to make sure that, you know, the small one-off owner operator could, could navigate this, the current situation because we could put more resources behind um, collecting data and make, being like a central point of reference. Um, the same goes for, you know, there's definitely a benefit being large when you're negotiating 6,000 leases, right? Because in a lot of ways, what we're doing is renegotiating uh, a lot of these leases and the terms that we're able to, to generate um, were definitely beneficial when you could say, hey, look, we have 100 um, Starbucks. And so let's look through the Starbucks lease and say, you know what, you know, we'll give you um, a deferral program if you give us you know, X, Y, and Z. It could be removals of restrictions that would allow us to add uh, an apartment tower or, you know, a, another outlot for another, um, you know, fast food service or a bank. Um, or it could just be, you know, um, giving us uh, ability for curbside pickup or you have to pay now rather through check for through wires. Just all these things that help you clean up your organization. So in a lot of ways, the lessons we, were, we learned in the last recession from our deferral and the program we took it to an account this way to make sure that, hey, everything we structured was was utilized to make sure that we're thinking long term. Yeah, and it, it seems like a lot of the the insights from from this crisis are that the the level of partnership between landlord and tenant was just like forced to increase that that, that alignment. And it sounds like just things like the the development of that app, it's it's in the tenant's best interest, right, to, to work with you. And do do you think that? On the other side of this, there's more of a kind of like full service relationship where it's not just about the, the landlord curating the tenants and trying to get the highest rents. It's, it's more of a um, kind of a partnership. Like what is the full suite of services you can offer me as a tenant that only you, Kimco, can offer versus a, a local owner down the street? Yeah, no question. I think that it, it, it does. Unfortunately, though, you can't paint it with a broad brush, right? Because some of these... Some of these retailers don't have the culture to want to share and exchange data and want to sort of be a mutual beneficial relationship. Um, and I, I don't necessarily see that changing for some, um, but the lion's share definitely have come to the table to say, Hey, we're in this together. What's a way we can enhance each other. You know, there's, there's ways that I think long-term um, the communication will just continue to improve. You know, the night again, that's a nice part about being large is we already had direct lines of communications with all these major tenants. Um, and the, just the, the partnership has definitely improved even further. And one of the things that you and I have talked a lot about is this, this kind of just fundamental like sea change that's happening in retail, right? Where you read a lot about the, the, the retail apocalypse, the kind of the, the demise of the old line brands. Um, but not a lot is said about the emergence of like these new brands, this new cohort, oftentimes of like digitally native retailers or emerging fitness or food concepts or healthcare concepts. Do you think that this crisis accelerates that trend? Meaning like in the same way that this, will, this may spell the end of you know, the bankruptcy for many established brick and mortar retailers, do you think that also paves the way both in terms of vacancy, but also in terms of consumer choice for new brands, new retailer concepts to, to emerge. Um, and how do you, Timco, think about like taking advantage of that? Yeah, no question. There's, you know, I've never been uh, probably more optimistic about our business because in a lot of ways it's shined a light on what's working and what's not, even in the most extreme environment. So if you take away the ability for you to walk through the door and yet you're still doing huge volumes, there's, there's a, there's, and because the store is being utilized as the last mile distribution point, 
there's more value there than there ever has been before. And so when you're able to reopen your door and re-engage your customer, all of a sudden that enhancement is gonna be um, turbocharged. And so there's, there's a lot of things that have occurred that I think have accelerated a lot of trends that were happening for the last five, 10 years. And the folks that were, you know, it takes a long time to sort of die in retail um, because sometimes they reorg and then they come through another type of, um, you know, metamorphosis. But it's very clear that if you came into this pandemic with a weak balance sheet or a weak business model, uh, you're not coming out of it. And so in a lot of ways, you know, there's, there's players that are going to take advantage of it. And you're seeing sort of the, 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 the sophisticated folks that have invested in digital that have invested in being able to understand what the consumer wants, what the consumer needs, and then layering on top of that, you know, the ability to um, have that loyalty program with them um, is because you've, you've seen, you know, Walmart's now launching their, um, their monthly service similar to, to Amazon's and you've got Target doing incredible delivery that's way faster now than Amazon. Um, so there is this like balancing act going forward. And I do think it'll pave, you know, with, uh, the road for new brands to come in because typically the digital players have better customer insights of where their customer lives, what they were really interested in. And so they can utilize that data to better place their physical locations. Um, and they're typically a little bit more on the cutting edge of understanding their customer um, better than anybody else. And then I think the store is going to evolve as well, especially with, you know, COVID. It'll be interesting to see how much, um, you know, virtual or augmented reality becomes uh, more of a, a place inside the store. What do you mean by that when you say a, a virtual reality in the store? So a lot of like folks like Lowe's and others are, are testing like augmented reality where you can come in and you can sort of, if you take a photo of your living room and you can then utilize sort of their augmented reality app to say place your your couch or your your you know your your outdoor furniture in different areas to see what it looks like and i think what you know the way that things are trending is there's just going to be more tech embedded in everything you do inside the store um and so that in a way you can pr in, in not too distant future you can probably in essence, look at, you know, what you would think you might want to buy and see it in your house before you even need to make the purchase to make sure that there is a uh, very little wiggle room that it wouldn't work. Yeah. Um, because, you know, one of the big issues that I see still occurring in retail is just the massive amounts of returns that are going on. People like buying things that just think they, they want or they need and then all of a sudden they don't want it and they send it back. So I think there's this, the next leg in my, my opinion, and again, I'm just thinking out loud, but maybe like in the next leg of, of, of evolution, there's going to be a way where people are able to make sure that what they're buying is exactly what they want. There's not this level of um, unknown or, or, or um, returns that's going to, you know, that, that should be skinnied up in my opinion. And, and the issue of returns is in some ways like closely connected to what a lot of these, these new brands, these kind of brands that leverage technology that, that, that are on the channel have, have thought about, which is they don't just think about the store as a, uh, a means to a cash register, right? It's, it's, a, it's both a marketing platform, it's a customer engagement platform, it's a customer learning platform. And, you know, what, what's interesting is we've heard a lot of landlords talk about, hey, how do you, how do you create a more aligned lease, just structurally, just in how you engineer and architect that lease? And a lot of landlords have said, well, more tenants are going to ask for percent rent, right? Because that, that's a that's a alignment mechanism between landlord and tenant. But there's also this notion of, could you define a, a, a radius, right, around the store where you know that if you open a store within, say, five miles of that store, you're likely going to see an uplift in the online purchases. And can the landlord take credit for that? Because in some ways, one of the uh, confounding variables in the lease was that people would buy stuff online and then take it back to the store. So if you just look at the store's net sales number, it was actually artificially low. What do you think right. that, long question, but what do you think that new lease structure looks like and how do you think the lease evolves? Yeah, that's, you, you, you've sort of hit on one of the biggest issues that I think is going to continue to evolve the lease going forward. And, and what we've done in our, in our situation is we've tried to understand how the retailer is um, taking credit for a sale. 
And so to your example, if something is done online in a zip code where a store sits, sometimes it's credited to the store, sometimes it's not. And then if the return gets back to the store, it would automatically ding the store, even if the sale was not done there. So what we've found is that the more sophisticated retailers that are starting to think long-term and incentivize their store managers around just productivity, they have the zip code of, hey, if the sale was made in that zip code, whether it was online or in the store, the store gets the credit. And that way, if the return hits the store, at least then the sale is also helping versus offsetting the, the, the return. And so what we've negotiated in a few cases is that the percentage rent should include that exact data saying, hey, if, that's, if that sale was done in this zip code, that counts towards the sale uh, the, the sales of the store. And so that way you're aligned with a lot of ways that the store manager is. And that's been the best path that I've seen. You know, we've tried to do it a hundred different ways. But I think if you make the argument that, hey, we just want to align with your store manager to understand, you know, how to, how to go about, you know, measuring performance. And so I think that makes sense to understand what leases of the future is going to look like. There will probably be some base rent in addition to percentage rent, just because most of the owners of these, of these assets need financing. Um, and so, you know, percentage rent only is very tough to model and very tough to predict. Um, and most people can't get financing just on percentage rent alone. So I do see there's a balance there that, you know, there, there could be a, a lower base rent and then a bigger portion of it maybe is uh, percentage rent. Um, but, you know, it's, it's going to be interesting because that's not only the thing that's going to change. Pandemic insurance is going to be part of it. You know, the, the, the force majeure clause that has all of a sudden become the hot ticket item um, is going to change as well. There's going to be all sorts of language in terms of, hey, if, if we're forced to close because of a government mandated issue like a pandemic, our, the landlord should be allowed to activate, you know, the, the, the sidewalk, the green spaces, maybe even takes on the parking lot and make it outdoor seating. All these things that we've been doing with the partnership that we have with our retailers, making them aware. But I think the lease language probably will start to change to incorporate that. And one of the other things that it seems like this crisis has just accelerated is the adoption of like on-demand delivery, right? So, I mean, pre-crisis, obviously Uber Eats and Postmates and Instacart were, were growing fast, but it was almost like you had the, this, this one-time effectively forced adoption of those services. And it would seem to me like that, that strongly favors grocery anchored centers, right? Because Instacart is obviously drawing out of those, those grocery stores, but a, a lot of the restaurants that I'm sure in your centers are also heav heavily leveraging those platforms. Do, do you think that um, kind of the, the, the way landlords define location um, starts to become a little more um, less specific? Meaning like, if the food can come to you, right, it doesn't really matter whether you're within a mile of a shopping center, you could be within five miles of it. And so do you think that it kind of changes the layout and the format of these centers in addition to their location? If you see very, very significant future adoption of these like on-demand delivery services? Yeah, no, no question about it. I think the, the spatial map of how you want to service a trade area is very different today. Um, and I think that's what retailers are starting to grapple with and figure out, you know, what stores are critical to making sure that they service their customer and what stores um, are redundant and uh, are not necessarily needed. And then what does that store need to look like to make sure that it does service the, you know, the area? Does it need a bigger back of house, you know, so that it can do more deliveries? Um, does it need a smaller front of house? Does it need, does it need to be a bigger buy? If you're going to consolidate three stores into one, does that store need to be bigger? Um, so there's, there isn't really a sort of a rule of thumb yet in terms of it depends on the, the industry that you're in and, and what kind of service you're in. But what we're finding is that, you know, we can track our data pretty well in terms of our traffic, in terms of where, you know, the sales are being produced. And so we can, we can sort of look at our map and say, you know, these are stores that are critical to the retailer because this is one that services a wide trade area. And if they were to remove this store from their network, they would have a huge hole. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that's the way that we're thinking about it is it's, it's in a lot of ways, it's that last mile distribution, right? So if you think about the, the grocery store, 
they're going to look at the map now differently and say, you know what, we can service with Instacart, you know, the, the, the 10 mile radius versus the five mile radius. And they right. can start to rethink how they, they lay out, but they're also going to probably need a different store prototype to, to, to actually service that amount because the volume is going to be different. Yeah. It feels like, you know, one of the things someone else made this comment to me and it, it resonated. It's, it's almost as if a lot of these on demand delivery apps have transformed point of sale stores into effectively distribution centers, right? Like to, to some extent, like the, the Whole Foods, you know, near me and the, the Safeway near me are effectively just distribution centers, like micro close to the edge of the consumer network distribution centers. And it's just interesting to think about like, what does then the shopping center look like in the future? Like, it, do you, do you think it looks like kind of an amalgam of consumers going to buy stuff directly at the center? And then kind of these ghost kitchens and, you know, micro distribution centers for like essential services. Um, because it almost would change yeah. the factor a lot of these centers. Yeah, I think it will. I think there's, there's definitely going to be a combination. Uh, and like you've started to see it already. Like we've been looking at, you know, a mix of uses or mixed use for a while now. And so typically the, the, the asset that we own is pretty underutilized in terms of the, the, the floor area ratio or the FAR of the asset. And what I mean by that is like 80% of our asset is typically parking lot. And then 20% is, is typically one story building um, for, of the retail that, that we house. And so when you think about the highest and best use of that real estate, you know, we're now concentrated in the top 20 metro markets in the country. That's like the most underutilized form of commercial real estate. Most people are vertical. Uh, and so when we look at the future of what our assets look like, that's what gets exciting because you can think about all the things that the future may hold or the future may unlock for us. And we can go through the entitlement process, which we've already done. We've, we've you know, entitled 5,000 apartment units so far. We think we can do another 5,000 in the next five years. But to your point about micro fulfillment centers, about, you know, what does the future of office look like? What does the future of residential look like you know there, there's so many things that can change and I still think if you have a great location with barriers to entry where it's underutilized you're going to have a lot of different levers a lot of different options and it's all about optionality and if yeah. you have access to capital and if you have awesome real estate those two ingredients typically lead to success long term. So one other thing I wanted to ask you about, because you mentioned it earlier, um, is I know Kimco's been very forward thinking on sustainability. And you mentioned that you did a, a, a green bond issuance. Can you just talk broadly, like what has Kimco done in that regard? And, and just define for people, what is a green bond and what do you intend to do with that? Sure. So I would say we were lucky to have um, two large institutional shareholders um, that were European um, that date back, you know, over a decade ago that were very, very focused on ESG and sustainability way before it became a buzzword in the U.S. And so, you know, in, in my experience at Kimco, because of that influence, we actually were um, pioneers in a lot of ways and in terms of making sure it was a focus of ours um, way before they started tracking it here in the U.S. And so in a lot of ways, we had a running start, um, which was great because we've been able to, um, to sort of set the standard on, on what real estate companies should be doing on, on sustainability. And there's no real sort of one, um, one sort of ingredient that like you should do. It's more, it's, it's implemented throughout the entire organization. And that way you can start to see ways that you can improve the community, ways that you can improve your asset. And so what we have done is, is done just sort of a holistic approach of a, a green approach of how do we go about rewriting our lease so that our sustainability um, initiatives are followed by our retailers. Because in a lot of ways, the landlord in shopping centers can only really control the open air spaces, so the common areas. Whereas inside the four walls is controlled by the retailer. That is unless you write in the lease that they have to follow your sustainability goals. And that's, you know, it's, it's tracking your energy usage. It's making sure your water usage, and we, we put submeters on everything. You know, we have solar panels on our roofs. Um, we've, we've, we've got a lot of different initiatives in terms of tracking water usage. Um, you know, the, 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 the trash recycling program that we have. It, it's Connor, not just like one thing. It's just a whole bunch that goes into it. And Connor, have you found that tenants are in, like, 
I'm curious their reaction to that. When you say, hey, you know, we want to help you become a more sustainable business. Have you found that they're supportive of that? They are. Yeah, they are. But sometimes they haven't really thought about it. Um, and so like they're, they're saying, hey, this is a good idea. We can do that. And then some, some people typically ask like how, how much more expensive is it going to be? Um, and so, you know, it's just a, getting them to understand that it's not necessarily more expensive. You just have to sort of understand that as you're building out your space, these are the things to follow. Um, these are the materials to use. These are the, the ways to, to go about making sure that you're, you know, you're following best practices. Um, you know, and the same goes for how we develop and redevelop our assets. You know, it's the, it's the, the water treatment. It's the, it's the, you know, understanding, you know, the materials that you use. You can go all the way to LEED certified if you want. That's the that's obviously one of the standards that that, that we use. Um, but LEED certification was developed for office buildings typically, so it's it's very limited in terms of what we think it could go into retail. So we've sort of developed our own standards there, um, and and that's the way we've been able to push the initiative forward. And then on the green bond, in essence, there's a whole laundry list of of rules that go into what qualifies as a, as a green bond and you have to follow these dedicated rules and reporting um, standards going forward. You're allowed to look back three years and then you have the 10 years to put the money to work. So we have 500 million that we were, we just took for a, a 10 year green bond. And what we see is that a lot of our redevelopments where we're adding multifamily or we're adding different uses, those buildings will be lead certified. So we have a lot of things that are already either built or under construction um, that we can, uh, that we can apply those funds to. Um, as well as, you know, initiating hopefully some new ideas on um, being leaders in the ESG category. We're, in, we're the only one in the Dow Jones Sustainability Index and in all retail world. We're the only ones in the um, FTSE for Good Index, which is a sustainability index as well. Um, we're, we were, won the award for NARI Leader of Light being the leader of, in, um, you know, the ESG initiatives. So all these things that I make, I make jokes sometimes that some of the initials that I don't even know what they stand for, we won awards for, but um, it's it's nice to be a leader in that that we continue to focus and want to push push the initiative. Yeah, and I think there's just a massive so sociological economic tailwind behind it. It's probably like the most universal issue now. Um, and it's true, it's, it's true. Like seeing, I, I've had a lot of conversations with with office landlords, and what they say is that especially for tenants that have a younger millennial workforce, you know, having working for a company that that has ESG standards and has sustainability standards is table stakes. It's just, yeah. that, is, that is what you do. And so in turn, those tenants are demanding of their landlords that they adhere to certain requirements. And I was curious on, on the retail side. So it's interesting to know that, you know, some tenants are going through that education process, it sounds like, through their landlord, through Kimco. So. Yeah, look, the larger players are, are, are definitely very, very much focused on it. Like the, the targets of the world, the Walmarts of the world, they're, they're leaders in, in a lot of cases. Um, and, and many times it's educating the smaller tenants, ed ed educating the mom and pop or the restaurants of, of, of how they operate their business, what they can do to just be more efficient. Um, and then from the landlord side of it, you know, again, it's sharing best practices. You know, we're, we're all for people you know, following our lead and, and making sure we lead by example, because we do think, you know, in a lot of ways, we're not setting these, these assets up for today, we're setting these up for the next generation. So we might as well, you know, make sure that we're sharing best practices so that the communities that we're improving, you know, it, it's not just our 400 plus assets. If others can follow us, then, then, then we are, are much stronger as a group. Right. Awesome. Well, Connor, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. It's been really interesting and uh, good luck with everything. I'm sure you're juggling a lot right now. <laughs> Thanks, Brandon. Always a pleasure. Thanks, Connor.